Okay, let's start looking at the readings. Reading number one. Ananda, who is kind of the straight man in the Pali Canon, <laughs> says, It's amazing, Lord, it's astounding how deep this dependent core rising is, how deep its appearance, and yet to me it seems as clear as clear can be. And the Buddha says, Don't say that. <laughs> Don't say that. Deep is this dependent core rising, deep its appearance. It's because of not understanding and not penetrating this dharma that this generation, i.e. the human race, is like a tangled skein, a knotted ball of string, like matted rushes and reeds, and does not go beyond the cycle of the planes of deprivation, woe and bad destinations. So, basically what we're saying up front here is if you don't understand this, you're in good company. (laughs) And don't expect that after one day you're expected to know all about dependent core rising, or that I will be able to entirely explain it to you in the course of one day. It's one of these topics that takes time, a lot of repeated reflection. And what we're going to be doing is is essentially soundings into the topic, some explorations of different points that I hope we will find useful. And then hopefully from here you will take these initial soundings or these initial explorations and explore them further. So this is just to get you in give you a toehold on the topic because it is complex and it is, as the Buddha said, it's very deep. Okay, now many times dependent core rising is explained as the working out of a causal principle. The causal principle is explained here in passage number two. It looks pretty simple. When this is, that is. From the arising of this comes the arising of that. When this isn't, that isn't. From the cessation of this comes the cessation of that. There are passages where the Buddha explains that the central insight to his awakening in just those terms. Now think about it. You know, the Buddha saw his previous lifetimes. He saw the cosmos. He saw beings dying and being reborn. You know, there's a lot of technicolor and panorama to his awakening. And yet what he explains is the really important lesson he learned from his awakening. It's this causal principle. Now, it looks basically like basing it. When there's A, then there's going to be B. It's a very simple causal principle. Actually, it turns out it's more complex than that. What you've got here are two different causal principles working together. The first causal principle is sentence one and sentence three. When this is, that is. When this isn't, that isn't. What we're talking about here is arising of causal relationships, arising and passing away in the present moment. When you've got A, then you're going to have B. If you don't have A, you don't have B. They come and they go together. An example would be um, spitting in the wind. Instantaneous. (laughs) When you spit in the wind, there's going to be spit in your face. When this is, that is. When this isn't, that isn't. Another thing is when you light a fire, there's going to be heat. When the fire goes out, the heat goes away. They're instantaneously coming and going away together. There's also the explanation that says, okay, when there's up, then there's down. When there's no up, there's no down. When there's east, there's west. When there's no, uh, when there's no east, there's no west. That's another way of explaining it. But more to the point is, you know, when there's contact, there's going to be a feeling. When the contact ends, the feeling stops. That's an example. You put your finger in the fire, it, it's going to hurt. You take your finger out of the fire, it stops hurting. So these are instantaneous things arising and passing away together. The second relationship is from the arising of this comes the arising of that. From the cessation of this comes the cessation of that. Now, this is causality that can happen over time. You have one event today, and then something's going to happen tomorrow. You eat bad food today, you have indigestion tonight. You don't study today, you fail the exam tomorrow. I mean, there's things that happen over time. Here we're talking about the relationship between events over time. So what you've got here is two principles interacting. Instantaneous cause and effect and then cause and effect over time. And I said this this is precisely when you've done any study of chaos theory. This is what chaos theory is all about. You've got feedback loops that come because some things arise and pass away together. Other things arise. take, Take a while before they show their effect. And it's a combination of the two that the Buddha said is what creates your present experience. If you weren't conscious right now, your past karma wouldn't mean anything at all. The fact that you're conscious right now means then you can experience the results of your past karma. It gets deeper than that. If you have intention right now, you will experience the past. If you have no intention right now, 
there's no experience of past input. And this is why the Buddha was able to gain awakening at one point in his life before all of his past karma had worked itself out. Because it was at that moment there was he brought, brought the mind to the point where there was no intention adding to the present moment. With a lack of that intention, there was no experience of the present moment. So he was outside of time and space. And that was his experience of the deathless. Now, the fact that you have these two factors working together, this explains an awful lot about the Buddha's teachings. First is, it explains why we have the teaching to begin with. You know, if you put an end to the causes of suffering and it was, it was all totally instantaneous, then as soon as the Buddha put an end to the causes of suffering, he would die. If there, was no, if there was no input that was going to carry over from the past. He would have come to the end of suffering, he would have died, and that would have been it. We wouldn't have known what he had done. So there'd be no teaching here to begin with. At the same time, it wasn't only through past karma that he was put in a position to gain awakening, because he didn't have to wait until his past, all of his past karma was, was worn out before he could see if the path actually worked or not. We mentioned this earlier. Now, suppose everything happens over time. The Buddha has, you know, it's like, okay, he has his awakening insight, but he's got all this other past karma standing in line. It's like coming to, the, it would be like coming to the, down to the Safeway. You know, you've bought, done all your shopping, and you get to the line, and there's this long line at the cash register. You don't know whether you're going to get, actually go, get to pay in time or not. It's going to take a while. But in the case with the Buddha, he goes to the front of the line. As soon as he gains his insight in the present moment, that cuts things apart. And so he doesn't have to wait for all of his other past karma to work itself out first. So this is why we have the teaching. Secondly, because this is a complex causal principle, this explains why we need a teaching to begin with. If suffering were simple, we would have all solved the problem a long time ago. Back when I first came back to the States, um, I think it was my third year at Meta, I finally went down and taught in San Diego. And I found out why I hadn't been teaching in San Diego before. Um, <laughs> there was an old surfer there. <laughs> and we were talking about the Buddha's life and the Buddha seeing the you know, aging, illness, and death and deciding he had to go out and find something in the, in the wilderness. And the old surfer raised his hand and said, I've always wondered about this. He said, you know, suppose after seeing the old person and the sick person and the dead person, what if he'd gone to the beach? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't that have changed his picture on, on, on life? And if, you know, if suffering were that easy, all you have to do is go down to the beach, we'd all be down at the beach, and that would be the end of it. <laughs> but because the causes of suffering are complex and somewhat chaotic, this is why we need a teaching to show, show us okay, why we're suffering, and what's happening, and how we can get out of it. Okay. Another important point about this the interplay of these two causal factors is that life is not totally deterministic, it's not totally random. When you have complex factors like this in, in, in any kind of interplay, even in just physics, you don't have to talk about psychology, even in physics and chemistry, they discovered that systems that are far from equilibrium that interact in chaotic ways like this are not totally deterministic, even on a physical level, much less a psychological level. They do follow certain laws, so they're not totally random. But at the same time, they're not totally deterministic. What this means is, because there is a pattern there, it means you can learn from the pattern. You know, lessons learned today will apply to tomorrow. I mean, if things were totally random, what you learn today might not apply tomorrow at all. And there are actually some theories out there. There are theories out there in the time of the Buddha. There are theories that you hear nowadays sometimes that think that each present moment is so totally individual that you can't learn anything which you've learned from past moments. You have to be just totally present in the present so you can grok the present moment and have an instinctive notion of what you should do in that present moment. But the Buddha's not saying that. He's saying, okay, there, there are patterns you can learn from the past and it's in developing these skills that you can get more and more skillful about what you bring to the present moment. At the same time, things are not deterministic. If they were deterministic, then there'd be no point in having a teaching anyhow. We'd be locked into wherever we are, where we're going. Nobody would be responsible for anything. You know, if I hit you, I would say, "Well, I just, you know, it was it was written in the stars. I had to hit you. You can't blame me." You know, that, that kind of attitude. And no matter how much you wanted to put an end to suffering, if it was totally determined that you were going to suffer, there'd be nothing you could do about it. But because the present moment, if you follow the 
I don't know if I want to go into all the details right now, but if you follow the logic of this causal principle, what it means is your experience of the present moment is made up of three things. You've got input coming in from past intentions, you've got your present intentions, and then you've got the results of your present intentions. Which means that the only thing, only one out of those elements is brought in from the past. The re results of past karma. And also your present moment depends on your having a present intention and experiencing the results of those present intentions. Some of those, some of those results will come right now. Which means on the one hand there are patterns coming in from the past, but you do have the freedom of choice in the present moment. How you're going to interact with that so you can create your present experience. So this means there are patterns, but there, it's also not totally deterministic. This is, this is why the teachings are useful. They can be learned as a skill, and they can also be applied to situations where you can make a difference. Okay. The principle of um, what's called this-that conditionality, which is these four statements of causality, also explains why the function of the Buddhist teaching is to find, give us knowledge of the sensitive points. Where in the cycle is it important to make a difference? Where can we make a difference? So it's all meant to be practical, to be applied to this issue of where in, the, where in the causal process there are the sensitive points that you can attack. But also, it explains why we use factors that are in the causal principle itself to take the causal principle apart. You know, like when you're learning, you'll be learning, we'll be learning later on in the day that you know, clinging to views is a cause of suffering. And yet, the first part of the path is right view. So, so you're going to be using things that you're eventually going to have to let go of. And they're designed so that it's kind of, I would, it's almost like planned obsolescence. You know, they're designed to deconstruct. It's more like that rice paper that Cheryl was showing the other day. You know, it's that, it's that clear paper you had that you can sew things onto, and then you put water on it and it dissolves. Okay. This is right view. <laughs> you use it to follow the path, and then when you don't need it any longer, it deconstructs. Okay. It deconstructs itself. So we're not, bringing, we're not bringing nirvana in to put an end to suffering. We're taking the things that we usually use as the causes of suffering, learn how to use them in a more skillful way so that we can put them aside. An analogy I like to use is can I play the five aggregates. So like a bag full of bricks that you're carrying around on your shoulder. What you, but you need a path. Okay, you take the bricks off your shoulder and you put them on the ground and you walk on them. So instead of carrying them around, you use them as a path and then they take you where you want to go. So you're not throwing the, you're not throwing the bricks away, you put them to use. Okay. The principle of, dependent of, of this, that conditionality also explains how the teachings are organized. I mean, you look at the suttas in the Pali Canon, and it's pretty disorganized. And what you see is person X comes to the Buddha with a problem, and the Buddha gives a specific answer to that problem. The next sutta, someone comes with a different problem. The Buddha gives a different approach to that other problem. What this comes from is the fact that if you're in a, in a chaotic system like this or a complex system like this, there are going to be many, many different feedback loops. Different people are at different sp spots in the cycle. And so they're going to require different teachings. This is why the Buddha didn't give one overarching explanation of what the Dharma all is. But what we have is if you compare it to, to medicine, instead of you know, teaching basic principles about medical cures, what you've got is a lot of stories about how a really good doctor cured different illnesses. And then what you, look, what you do as a reading these stories is to figure out, okay, who's got the same illness I've got? And then you try that approach. So this is why it, there's, there's, the Buddha never organized anything in just one big fell swoop. The principle of this that conditionality also explains the contents of the teaching. And the Buddha will teach sometimes on the cosmic level, and then sometimes will teach on the level of the present moment. And if you have any experience of reading about chaos theory, you know that they have something called scale invariance, which means that what you see on a small level is the same thing you see on the large level. So you don't have to take the universe apart. All you have to do is take the present moment apart which is why so much of the teaching is focused on focusing on how you're contributing to the present moment. Learn how to take that particular unskillful pattern apart and the whole network of suffering will fall apart as well. 
And finally, this that conditionality explains how the Buddha presented his teaching, as I said earlier. He had to be sensitive both to his listeners' past karma and to their present attitude. Now, there's some people whose past karma was so heavy that you know, they couldn't gain awakening. There are a couple of cases. I mean, the Buddha says, if you've killed your father, killed your mother, um, killed an arahant in this lifetime, you're not going to gain awakening. Because, you know, the, the regret for those acts is going to get in the way. There's a sort of a, kar- a karmic blockage there. And so when the Buddha was in- encountered people like that, he would teach them more about the precepts, he would teach them more about living a, a health, you know, healthy, moral life. Because they realized, okay, they had some karma there that they just couldn't overcome in this lifetime, but at least get them on the right path. In other cases, he saw that, and saw that their past karma was ready, and all they needed was a slight change in their present attitude. So that was what he provided. So just the way the Buddha teaches, the fact that we have the teaching to begin with, the fact that we need the teaching, the use of the teaching, its function, its organization, its contents, its presentation, all these things can be explained by this causal principle here in passage number two. It's a chaotic feedback loop. Not, not chaotic in the sense of being totally random. I mean, there are patterns here, but there are, it's, it's not deterministic, so you, you, know, you can learn and can make a difference, but there's enough of a pattern that you can also learn from and apply. Um, any questions on passage number two here? That was an awful lot for you to swallow. <laughs> Hi, John. Uh, how do you understand the, the saying that I, I think is attributed to the Buddha and uh, appears in the Nikayas uh, that if we see the present moment correctly, uh, the causes and conditions in the present moment correctly, then we should be able to see all of the past no. and all of the future? No. You, what you see is... Um, you see the way things operate in the present moment, then you will understand the way things operated in the past and the way things will operate in the future. So it's the same pattern that goes across the board. So you don't see that as being counter or like similar to the idea of determination? Exactly. Because yeah. what you see is that every present, if you see in the present moment that you have the choice to make a difference, that meant in the past you also had the choice to make a difference. In the future we'll also have the choice. And if you, you know, if you apply that ability unskillfully now, okay, you're going to have unskillful, you're going to have unpleasant results. And the same thing was in the past. You applied thing, you you used your intentions unskillfully in the past, which is why you suffered. And if you continue being unskillful in the future, you're also going to suffer as well. That's as much as you can learn by looking at the present moment. Sometimes that saying is is twisted a little bit when they say, if you want to know your past, just look at your present, which is not true. All you see is a little bit of your past when you look at the present. We don't have one karmic account. We're not watching sort of, you know, the, the, your, your current balance is not your total balance. You've got lots of karmic seeds, some of which are sprouting now, some of which already sprouted in the past and have stopped, others which have not sprouted yet. And you can't see that by looking at any one person in the present moment. If that's the case, then how would the Buddha be able to see all of his past lives and all of the karma of so many various kinds of things and the arising and, and falling of various, what is it, innumerable world systems and all of that? He had good eyes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, what I was saying is, is, suppose you look at a person, you're not seeing the totality of their past karma just by looking at their, what their, their present circumstances are. Now, the Buddha, can all, he, had the, he had the memory to go back and say, oh, so-and-so did this, 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 and this. But still, what you're seeing right now as you look at a person is not the totality of that person's past karma. They're two very different things. Do you see the distinction? No, I don't. Okay, okay fine. There's the ability just to look at the circumstances of a person's life right now, which anybody can do. But with looking at the circumstances of my life, you can't tell everything that I did in the past. Right? Because not every action I did in the past was aiming at being a monk you know, right now sitting and talking to you. And I smoked pot in college. 
You, you, know, you can't see that. <laughs> it seems like if my eye were tuned really correctly, no, if you're, if your I would be tuned, able yes. to. Yes, you, you but could, it's all you could, you, could catch, you could catch the trace of whatever's left in my... In my you know. Now, someone like the Buddha could actually... He would operate on a memory, his ability to look at someone and see, okay, what that person's past lives were, what that person's potential in the present moment is right now, which... Most of us with ordinary eyesight, we can't see. Okay. Because he had a memory? Because he what? Because he had a memory of it? Because he had the psychic power that he developed through his meditation. And even then, he wasn't seeing the totality of all their past actions. He was just seeing, okay, what are the relevant factors that could, can be sprouting, uh, ready to sprout right now? And the only person whose total lifetimes he saw were his own. And, and he went back many, many aeons. And even then he said he couldn't go all... You can't find a beginning back there. Even the Buddha says that's unknowable. You know, a beginning point for un- ignorance, he says, is totally unknowable. And but we, with our ordinary eyesight, what we see are just, you know, which karmic, past karmic seeds are sprouting right now. Thank you. There's a question here. Um, My question was about your comment. Um, You were talking about the Buddha and when he made his intention Mm -hmm. and that that then allowed him to um, deal with his past karma. I I kind of quite, I didn't quite understand exactly what he was saying. Back up a bit. As I said just recently, um, your experience of the present moment is composed of three things. There's results of past karma, past intentions, um, your present intentions, you actually experience your present intentions. And then some of the results of your present intentions are experienced right now. This, these are the three factors that make up an awareness of the present moment. Now what he did was he found a way not to have present intentions. And without the present intentions, the whole the present moment falls apart. Now the question is how you do that, and that's what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the day. The what? Oh yes, the, the screen that you can dissolve. Well, that's actually the screen that you can dissolve is the, are the, the views that bring you to that point where you can get to the point where you develop the skill to put an end to intention, and then you drop it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There are other hands over here. Sure. When you were talking earlier um, in response to the, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, um, Ayatolika, thank you. Um, it struck me that what the Buddha got very good at was pattern recognition. Mm-hmm. And he could apply that, um, if you will, to a lot of situations. And, um, and then as you were going over with us, you know, the three things that... Um, it was as if um, those are helpful ways of remembering to look for these patterns in all of us. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know, looking at it this way kind of lets me stand back a little bit from the intensity of the experience and gives me like a breathing space. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's where this... Um, I don't know, the value in learning these things uh, comes in really handy. (laughs) Because it isn't, I mean, I want to be able to use it naturally, but reflecting and seeing that little bit of distance I can gather, some peace, if you will, in that moment, and not identify with the whole thing, just recognize I'm looking for a pattern here, and figure out if I can see the pattern. If I can't, then, you know, say, hopefully that will appear to me later. Well, precisely, you're looking for patterns as opposed to the me in here. Um, yeah. We're trying to depersonalize the pattern. Yeah. So I, our, our normal way of doing things, if this is my way of doing things, this is my Cheryl way of doing things, I'm going to continue with my Cheryl way of doing things because if I don't, it's not Cheryl anymore. You know? That's what we've got to work through. You say, well, wait a minute, some of these things that I'm doing are unskillful. 
And again, if you learn how to get the eye out of there and just look, okay, what is the pattern that we're, what's going on here? And you see, okay, this is an unskillful pattern. Let's change the intention that's brought into it. So you're not confined by your notion of your way of doing things and that you have to stick to that. So we're looking for patterns, yeah. Thank you. Question here? Front mic. When you said that the, <clears throat> the Buddha, and I imagine anyone who, who uh, experiences awakening, goes to, head of the, goes to the head of the line at the Safeway store, um, did you mean forever and ever, or after an experience of awakening, you, you still have to work on your... You still, have, you still have past karma that you've got to, right. to deal with, but you're no longer bringing ignorance to it. Maybe as, as much ignorance. Well, if it's total awakening, no ignorance. Okay. Something to think so some more about. about. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, skillfulness um, and awareness, mm-hmm. I'm here, I think I'm hearing you say that developing awareness is a skill. Mm-hmm that you can keep sharpening. Right. And it's, I mean, there, you get to the point where there's enough awareness that you can have an awakening. Um, and they, they talk about levels of awakening. There are basically four levels of, of, the first three are called seeing the Dharma eye. And then the fourth is the final, is the total awakening. Now for those first three, there's still more skills to be developed around this. But finally with, with total awakening, then you have developed all the skills you need to no longer cause suffering. And if you um, develop the skill of awareness, that's just the first skill because you can't change it. You, you, you don't necessarily have the skill to change it just because you're aware of it. Or are you saying once you're aware of it, it's changed? Once you're aware of it, it's changed because everything, everything you experience has an element of your intention involved in it. And the more awareness you have around things, then that will change the quality of your intention. Okay, so... The awareness allows you to drive. Right. That's simple. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Could you give a couple of examples of intention? Intention. Um, you come into a room, the intention to make money off of the people in the room is very different from the intention to be helpful to the other people in the room. Now, the intention to say, I'm doing both, is another intention. You know? I'm going to make money off these people and I'm going to help them at the same time. That gets complex because then you've got two alternative intentions that are fighting each other. So then the intentions um, of the past, then that's what that's operative in terms of the results of it right now in this moment. Mm -hmm. And there's also uh, the present intentions that um, are affecting this moment and the future. Right. And by seeing all of that, being aware of it, total awakening. What you're trying to be aware of is what intention are you bringing right now to the present moment, regardless of what the results of your past intentions are. I mean, based on our past intentions, we're now human beings. So that's kind of a given right now. Now, how much longer this is going to last, nobody can guarantee. Even the Buddhist, even in the, the suttas, you have you know the case of the monk who gains awakening and then goes out and gets run over by a runaway cow. You know very quickly. So that, you know, that, that human, that particular human karma, you have no idea how much long it's going to last. But at least at the moment, this is what you're experiencing coming in from your past karma. Now the question is, what do you want to do with this human ability, this set of human abilities you have? And each of us has a different set of abilities based on our individual karma. Now if you decide you want to give a life of service, if you want to get, devote your life to meditation, that's a different intention right now that's going to influence the way you approach the present moment. Or even up just just a simple thing like listening to the Dharma. The Buddha says, you know, some people come to listen to the Dharma because they want to find fault with him. Okay, they're going to hear a certain set of things that the other people who come to learn are not going to hear, and vice versa. You know, the intention you bring here is going to determine what you hear and what you take home with you. So. 
uh, just one other part to that that I try and understand. If my intention is to um, learn how to be aware, mm -hmm. and I think that's my intention, then as I start looking at that intention, it's why I want to be aware. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's I want to be aware to serve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it keeps growing and like it's the seed just goes by itself after you start it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the way it is. Okay. That's what we're starting out with. We're starting out with fairly complex in intentions. And as, as we meditate, it's one to get aware of those different levels of intention and to just start paring down the unskillful parts.